and we're going to be continuing in the book, Devil Worship, The Shocking Facts. And we're going to continue in the same chapter that we've been on, which is, I think, chapter 7, The Eating of Things Sacrificed to Idols. And we left off on about page 415 in this particular area particular area we're under right now, the last main heading that was covered last week, was the prophet Isaiah and the mystery religions. The prophet Isaiah and the mystery religions. And, then, uh, and it shows here that it's not readily apparent to this world that Yahweh's prophets of old sternly warned against the idolatrous practices of the mystery religions. And you just remember how the mystery religions, you know, they, how they spread out you know, from Alexandria, Egypt, you know, and how they, you know, and how they just kind of proliferated, and they just kind of, they, I mean, I mean, they grew the roaming army. You know, they, you know, they took these things throughout to all the known world, and and uh, and uh, you know, when they went out to when they went to the faraway lands, uh, you know, to conquer those lands, they also brought back practices that were being done to those gods there, and they brought those back with them. So we see these different traditions. Uh, throughout all the worldly holidays today, and it's all um, it's all a melting. It's all uh, it, it's all um, I'm going to say like an amalgamation. It's everything's being just put together um, in these traditions. You know, a little bit from this from from this uh, uh, this pagan ritual, and then another one from this one, another one from here. And the, some of these things are so far removed. You know, with the you know the world doesn't realize where the origin of these things came from and they think that they're honoring their creator when they practice these things well Yahweh tells us over and over and we're going to see that uh, even more today that we cannot honor him in the way the heathen worship their gods he will not accept those practices at all and uh, but it shows here a pastor he shows us here he says that these it's not readily apparent the, the, the depth of these things isn't really readily apparent um, it says, and he shows here, he says, but when one begins to really study the book of the prophets for themselves, they will find these warnings clearly written. And we're going to be in Isaiah 65 and 66 this evening here. And he shows here that says one reads, uh, uh, when one reads Isaiah 65 and 66, uh, we find that the prophet Isaiah rebukes the nations which each thing sacrificed to idols. Um, and Isaiah rigorously condemned the rites and the rituals associated with the underworld and its dying and rising gods. And if you remember, um, you know, if you go back to the, uh, um, the deception concerning Yahweh's calendar of events, you know, there's, there's uh, a pastor goes through a pretty in-depth discussion in that book on the ancient pagan cycle of sun worship. And it, it all, you know, it all centers around the rising, the, the birth and the death and the rebirth of the gods throughout the year. And that's what all of these things, all of these things are, 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 are centered on and they're symbolized um, and, and, they're, and they're actually tied in with the different seasons. You know, the, the springtime is tied in with the rebirth and then the, the, the autumn and, and going down into the... Uh, into the end of the winter time is dealing with the death and the and the loss of the god and then around christmas time you have the rebirth of the sun god and you know the rebirth of the of the god or the goddess and then the vegetation and stuff starts coming back and then you have the fertility rites that are found in the spring and it all center and then that's the cycle that's then in a nutshell that's kind of the cycle um but this is you know this is this is this is what pastor's showing us here he says, now let us begin our study of Isaiah 65, 3 through 5 in the King James Version, and we find these proofs written herein. And, and, and it shows here, it says, a people that provokes me to anger continually to my face, that sacrifice in the gardens and burn incense upon altars of, of brick, which remain among the graves and lodge in the monuments, which eat swine's flesh and the broth of abominable things is in their vessels, which say, stand by yourself, do not come near me, for I am holier than you. Uh, holier than thou, for these are a smoke in my nose and a fire that burneth all the day. Now, I know we kind of covered this last week, but we're going to continue on in this same study today. So that's kind of why we're going, just kind of doing a, just a real brief, uh, just real briefly going back over this. Um, to provoke Yahweh to anger. It's idolatry which provokes Yahweh to anger here. And it says, in effect, um, it says the, 
The context of Isaiah 65, 3 clearly shows that the idolatrous practices of those who provoked Yahweh continually to his face, you know, the, you know, in the, um, in effect, right in front of him, these people were practicing rituals which he did not command, and these rituals are written in Isaiah 65, 3 through 5. You know, Yahweh gives us very clear instructions on what we are to do and what we are not to do. And, um, you know, the priests who eat swine's flesh, you know, they, you know, they hid, you know, they, they, they hid and they intentionally rebelled against the written word of Yahweh. And, you know, of course, you know, that's, uh, you know, and we see, we, we see the results of that. You know, we see the results of what, of, of what, that, of, of what that brings. Now, the sacrifice in the gardens. Uh, this first ritual which Yahweh condemned was that of sacrificing in the gardens. And, and he shows here, he says, a garden can take all forms from a potted plant, you know, to a city park. And, uh, and, and actually, some of these rituals that we're going to see here actually had to do with, with just simply planting uh, very fast sprouting seeds in pots, you know, and carrying them to the roof, and then they would, where they would live and they would die readily, you know, in a, in a very, very quickly, you know, a very, a very quick fashion, but that was in honor of, of, the, of this god, Adonis. You know, and, you know, we see this here, Adonis, uh, which is uh, where we get the word Lord from, Adonis, Adon, it embodies the yearly growth and death of vegetation. And it says, in the Greek myth, he was a beautiful youth, a son of Mira, of Mira and, and Mira or Smyrna, by her incest with her father, uh, Cenreus, king of Cyprus. Now notice that this god was born out of an illicit relationship. Okay, born out of incest. Okay, now Aphrodite, the goddess of love, loved Adonis and mourned bitterly when he was killed by a boar when hunting. And remember, we covered some of that, you know, a, a, a few weeks ago. You know, some of the traditions around, around Christmas time, you know, kind of celebrate, especially with the eating of the swine, eating of the pig. You know, that's the, that is the people that are, that, that's the people who are celebrating this, getting revenge on this pig that actually killed this god. You know, and they're offering this back. They're af- actually offering this this pig back to this you know back to this god. I mean, it's kind of a it's, it's kind of a messed up you know messed up thing in your mind. But but that's but that's what they were doing. You know, you can kind of see the you know this confusion. Um, but it shows here. It says Zeus allowed him to spend part of the year with Aphrodite and part with Presperon in the underworld, hence he dies and rises again annually. So, you know, again, this falls right along the lines with the seasons. Um, At his festivals, he was ceremonially mourned and seeds were planted in shallow pots of well-watered earth to grow quickly and soon fade again, the famous Gardens of Adonis. Now, pastor shows here and he clarifies and he shows that Adonis was the representation of the yearly growth and death of vegetation. He was killed by a boar, which actually gave, uh, gave bodily form to the spirit vegetation, ve- the spirit of vegetation. And those who sacrificed in these gardens, as the prophet Isaiah said, ate swine's flesh, an act which provokes Yahweh to anger continually. Um, now, if you remember, we kind of, like I said, we kind of, kind of looked at that, but then if you jump back to page 404, if you jump back here to page 404, um, about the middle of the page there, remember it says the boar was sacrificed to the god for the injury a boar was fabled to have done was fabled to have done to him. According to one version of the story, the death of Adonis or Tammuz, as we have seen, uh, in consequence, a wound from the tusk of a boar that he died, and so um, you know, and this is uh, you know this is why you know again one of the reasons that. Uh, um, oh, you know that that uh, that ham or that, or that pork and stuff is eaten at the time of, of Christmas, and that's part of that tradition, especially that boar's head. You know, hence the the boar's head is still a standing dish in England at the Christmas dinner. When the reason of it is when when the reason of it is long since forgotten, and that's the thing with these traditions. People just blindly follow these traditions, but they never look. They never stop to think where they came from. You know, they think it's all in honor of their creator. Well, it has nothing to do with that. 
You know, they just, like I said, they just blindly follow these traditions. And we can't, you know, we, you know, pastor has done, like I think mentioned before, you know, pastor, you look at the research that pastor did and how pastor was led in all of this research. Because when he did this research, remember, the internet wasn't readily available. You couldn't go to the computer and punch in, you know, and punch in the, uh, the word Adonis and have all of these things pop up and, and uh, okay, well, see, I got this one here. I can look at this one and this one and this one, you know, and just have it pop up on the screen. You know, you actually had to do the footwork. You had to go to the libraries. You had to physically have the books in hand. You know, when you have a book this thick in your hand, now you have to find the parts of that book that relate to what you're studying. You know, so you look at just the sheer man hours, the sheer amount of time, you know, that, that went into the research and you know pastor was led. You know pastor is led by Yahweh. There's no doubt. But it shows here, it says, uh, you know, to, uh, to remain among the graves or to lodge in the mon uh, monuments. These worshipers, uh, uh, as it says in Isaiah 65, 4, the King James Version, remain among the graves and lodge in the monuments. Now, from the Anchor Bible, the second edition, we find a clarification here, and it shows it was a common practice to spend the night in the temple or shrine in the hope of receiving an or or auricular dream. Uh, you, know, a, you know, a dream that, uh, you know, an auricular dream would be kind of like a dream uh, uh, where a god or a deity would reveal some type of hidden knowledge or divine purpose you know, you know, through a dream or through or, or through an individual, um, and you see the word and you see the word uh, uh, incubation, and that means to simply keep conditions good for. And it says this is just the definition: as to keep under conditions, and it says good for hatching or development. So what they had done is that they would remain among the graves, you know, which was. You know, after going through these celebrations, they would stay there and spend the night hoping that everything that was done would be pleasing to the gods and that they would be rewarded with some type of, with some type of hidden knowledge that was going to be received. Okay? And it says, the Holy Scriptures are filled with warnings against the worship of the dead. You know, the, the Holy Scriptures are filled with this from the encyclopedia uh, dictionary of religion that shows here dead the worship of and it says the historical historically ambivalent forms of interaction with and commemoration of the dead found in most cultures and religions such interaction may be said to be positive when its help is extended to the dead by providing an adequate tomb effect, effective rituals food offerings prayers and the observance of, of mourning periods well what do the dead know Nothing. Do the dead know any of this is going on? No. They're asleep. Think about it. When we go to sleep at night, do we remember going to sleep? Do we remember what takes place when we're asleep? No. You know, the dead. The dead know nothing. They don't know anything that's going on around them. They're, they're just, they're, they're, and they won't. They never will. You know, but they do. They, they, they have these effective rituals and these food offerings and these prayers and the observance of mourning periods. You know, it's all, you, know you think about the, the funeral rites and things like that. Who's that for? Who's that the benefit for? Well, it's the benefit for those that have been left behind. Uh, you, know, it's, uh, you know, it's negative. It's negative when the dead, like other spirits, ghosts, and demons with whom they often merge, are considered a threat to the living. Okay. In this case, the offerings of prayers and magical techniques were aimed at restraining the dead from the, a a from the acts of destruction and revenge. Often both attitudes coexist side by side. The worship of the dead was prevalent in those primitive societies which engaged in sun worship. Okay. In those societies which engaged in sun worship since they believed that the sun carried the dead to the underworld at sunset and could restore them to the light at dawn. And then on the top of page 416, it shows here, it's a, and it continues and it shows in ancient Greece, the food offerings were laid at a, at a crossroad every month for, for the goddess of the underworld and for the ghosts of those who could not rest in their graves. In the Old Testament, traces remain of sacrifices offered to or for the dead and the practice of furnishing them with food, 
even though this was condemned by official Judaism, and it shows there uh, Deuteronomy chapter 26 and verse 14. Okay, so we see these practices were there, but yet they, it shows that even shows and admits that they were it was condemned. It says the worship of the dead is not limited to pagan antiquity, and it's still prevalent today. Anybody have any idea how the worship of the dead could be prevalent today? Halloween. Halloween that's one. That's another one. Well, yeah, okay, yeah, that's a, that's yeah, that's another one. Um, how about certain practices in the Catholic Church? Yeah, praise Yahweh. There you go, praying to the saints. Absolutely. And it shows here. It says, from talking to dead saints to praying to Mary, the Mother of God, to leaving food in cemeteries for the dead ancestors, the practice continues throughout this deceived whole world. But the dead know nothing. They simply do not hear. And Yahweh inspired this truth to be written in Psalm 146, 3 through 4. And he says, Do not put your trust in princes nor in sons of men, in whom there is no help. When his breath leaves him, he returns to the earth, to his earth. In that very day, his thoughts perish. Okay? So it's very clear that the thoughts perish. You know, Pastor shows here, he says, So when one is actually... So who is one actually talking to when he or she is spending time in a church, in a temple, or a shrine, or cemetery, talking to the dead? Well, we've seen this worship, we've seen this, and uh, we have seen this is the worship of the gods of the underworld, the same gods of the mystery religions, the idolatry which provokes Yahweh to anger, the worship which Isaiah was inspired to condemn. Now, there was a book uh, called... Um, Babylon Mystery Religion, a little book, a little thin book. Anybody ever read that book? Praise Yahweh. I'm gonna, I'd like to read a little bit out of that because it says here specifically talking about, uh, about praying to the saints. And it, it, it shows here, you know, the, you know, this individual, I mean, you know, he could have, you know, it sounds like he was reading things that were, you know, that pastor had been writing. Um, but he later actually recanted. And uh, said that uh, the things that were ta- that he had written about in that book were were taken out of context, and and uh, he recanted almost everything that he had said in there. Uh, I think somebody got to him, but that's uh, but that's neither here nor there. But uh, in chapter four here, in chapter four of this book, it talks about saints, saints' days, and the symbols. And it actually mentions here, it says, repeatedly, in the, repeatedly the Bible condemns all attempts to commune with the dead. Okay? And yet many recite, and many recite the Apostles' Creed, which says we believe in the communion of saints, supposing that such includes the idea of prayers for and, uh, for and to the dead. Concerning this very point, the Catholic Encyclopedia says, the Catholic teaching regarding prayers for the dead is bound up inseparably with the doctrine of the communion of the saints. And it shows here, what are the objections to these beliefs? We will let, uh, we will let the Catholic Encyclopedia answer for itself. It says, the chief obje- uh, objections raised against the intercession and invocation of the saints are that these doctrines are supposed to be, are supposed, are, are opposed to the faith and trust which we should have, and, and it says in God, but it's in Yahweh alone, and that they cannot be proven from the scriptures. Okay, that this, these practices of praying to the saints on behalf of the dead cannot be supported in scriptures, but yet it is in depth, it is in, uh, you know, it is, it is a, 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 a very intricate part of the, uh, of the universal worship. It says, now, where, now nowhere do the scriptures indicate that the living can be blessed or benefited by prayers to or through those who have already died. It says, instead, in many ways, the Catholic doctrines regard saints are very similar to the old pagan ideas uh, that were held regarding the gods. Well, yes, they were very similar. They're one and the same. As he points out here, it says, looking back again to the mother of the false religion... Babylon, which means what? Confusion, praise Yahweh, which, which means confusion. We find the people prayed to and, uh, and uh, pr- prayed to and, and honored a plurality of gods. In fact, the Babylonian 
In fact, the Babylonian system developed until it had some 5,000 gods and goddesses. 5,000? Uh, but it shows every month and every, every month and every day of the month was under the protection of a particular divinity. There was a god for this problem and a god for each of the other o different occupations, a god for this and a god for that. And that's how he put it. He said, with the idea of gods and goddesses associated with various events in life, now established in pagan Rome, it was but another step for these same concepts to finally be merged into the Church of Rome. Okay, and if you remember, that's one of the things that, that, were, that was brought about. You know, that was one of the things that was done with the Council of Nicaea, how they took the, the worship of, the, of these two gods, uh, um, Mithra, and uh, what was the other one? Mithra and who? Who was it? Mithra and who? Zeus? How about Krishna? Mithra and Krishna, remember? Or, uh, Krishna and Zeus and Krishna. Uh, Constantine was a Mithra worshiper. Okay, but these two gods, remember, these two gods were combined. And so were their ideas, and so were their, you know, so were the, all of their, um, you know, all of their, um, their practices, their rituals, you know, they were all combined. Um, but it says here that since the, um, it says, since the converts from paganism were reluctant to part with their gods unless they could find some satisfactory counterpart in Christianity, the gods and goddesses were renamed and called saints. Okay, they weren't done away with. They weren't told you can't you can't worship these anymore. They put the word they put the letters S T in front of it. You know, saint. So they what they did is they Christianized it. We're going to look at that word here in just a second. Christianized to see what that means. This is the old idea. Uh, uh, the old idea of gods associated with certain occupations and days has continued in the Roman Catholic belief in saints and saints days as the following table shows. Now there's, I'm gonna to try to see if I can get this where you can see it. Okay, but there's one set. You can see right there, there's, I don't know how many are there, but they have, these are different saints for different occupations. They've got actors, they've got architects, they've got, uh, um, yes, they have butchers, see right there? They got butchers, they've got bakers, and yes, they have candlestick makers in here right there. Okay? Uh, but they have them for librarians and lawyers and hunters and housekeepers and merchants. And here's some more merchants, miners, musicians, nurses, pharmacists, pharmacists, uh, steel workers, students, surgeons, tax collectors. And then they also had saints for barren women. They had saints for beer drinkers. That's the second one right here. All right, see it right there? Beer drinkers, domestic animals, family troubles, fire, floods, lightning, storms. Um, for the poor, they got a saint for television. Okay, right here, they got a saint for television. Um, and then they have... Uh, uh, to pray, they got to pray to certain saints for help with certain problems they have. Uh, for, look at this, for different diseases. Uh, diseases of the eyes, of the throat, epilepsy, fever, foot diseases, gallstones, headaches, heart trouble, insanity. You know, skin diseases, all of these things, um, you know, is what they have, you know, is, is, is where they directed their, their prayers to. Their prayers were directed to the saints instead of to the one whom could have actually helped heal them from these things through simple obedience to the laws that he gave us. You know, but they, they but everybody insists, you know, but they insist on teaching against these things. And then th this individual, he points us out and he says, "But well, why pray to saints when Christians have access to God?" It says, "You know, why why do we do that? Why would we want to do that?" It says, Catholics are taught that through, that through praying to the saints, they may be able to obtain help that God otherwise might not give. Okay? 
It says they are told to worship God and then pray first to St. Mary and the holy apostles and the holy martyrs and all of God's saints to consider them as friends and protectors. Well, they're dead. They can do nothing. There's only one protector. Yahweh is our protector. And that protection comes through our simple obedience. Obedience to his laws. That's where, the, our, that's where protection comes from. It says they're it's sought, to, it's sought to consider them as friends and protectors. And to implore their aid in their hour of distress with the hope that God would grant to one patron what he might consider or what he might otherwise refuse to the supplicant. In other words, the person that's in trouble, their God's going to say, no, I'm not going to help you. You're on your own, buddy. But that saint says, oh, come on. Pretty please help him. All right. You know, but that's the idea. That's the idea that they're putting forth. You know, that's the idea that they're putting forth, and that's the idea, uh, you know, and see, that's kind of the idea where they put forth that mean old God of the Old Testament. And they say he's that mean old God because when you displease him, he brings all these curses. He throws these, all these curses out at you. Well, when you read Deuteronomy 28, when you read, when you read the law, you find out that all of these curses come upon the people simply because of their disobedience. You know, it's nothing, it's nothing that's being thrown at them. It's what they bring upon themselves. And that's what the scripture shows. But that is not what the Catholic Church and, or any other church, that, that's not what they teach. You know, everything, uh, it says, everything considered, it seems evident that the Roman Catholic system of patron saints developed out of the earlier beliefs in gods devoted to days, occupations, and the various needs of human life. Many of, the, many of the old legends that have been associated with the pagan gods were transferred over to the saints. You know, so they took the stories about these gods and they transferred them over to the saints, the Catholic saints. The Catholic Encyclopedia even says that these legends repeat the conceptions found in the pre-Christian religious tales. The legend is not Christian, only Christianized. Now, what in the world does that mean? Something Christianized. Well, maybe I'm not going to get to it here. But it says it's only, it's Christianized. It said it's Christianized. Well, when you look up the Christianization, when you look up and see what that Christianization means, and it means the conversion of individuals to Christianity or the conversion of entire groups at once. It may also refer to forced imposition of a Christian society. It was Christianized. It was forced upon the people. You know, just like, you know, just like, just like it was in the days of Constantine, just like it was back in the days of the Crusades and the Inquisitions. The Catholic, that way, that universal way of the rejection and the pushing aside of the, of the laws of Yahweh was forced upon the people. You know, it wasn't something miraculously, miraculous and, and wonderful and willing even that took place, but it was forced. And that's in this word, you know, this was a forced imposition of a Christian society. And it shows that various strategies and techniques were employed um, in Christianization campaigns from late antiquity throughout the Middle Ages. Um, and it even shows here, it says, a notable strategy for Christianization was, they call it interpreta uh, interpretatio Christiana, the practice of converting native pagan practices and culture pagan religious imagery and pagan sites and the pagan calendar to Christian uses, okay? Well, this, that big old long word, that interpretati and interpretatio Christiana, Christiania, in essence, what it means, it means that it was intended that the traditions and practices that existed, uh, but the reasoning behind them was altered. In other words, you know, the, the same practice uh, of, of the worship of these gods and the way that they do, the way that it was set up originally in the pagan mind, that was changed. And, and they, they changed the reasoning. The, the church changed the reasoning over to make it something acceptable. Okay? 
you know, they kind of change the names. They change the names of it to protect the guilty, so to speak. Okay? In essence, it was intended that traditions and practices still existed, but that the reasoning behind them was altered. The existence of syncretism in Christian tradition has long been recognized by scholars, and in recent times, many instances of syncretism have also been acknowledged by the Roman Catholic Church. Now, have we ever heard that term syncretism before? Remember, that was one of the ancient philosophies that came out of Alexandria, Egypt, remember? And remember what the basis behind that one was. The basis behind that was that the church would change to meet the needs of the people. The religion would change to meet the needs of the people. The people dictated what the church would do. The church would come into unity with the people. And remember, that was one of the things that Constantine did. You know, in order to in order to gain the in order to gain, you know, the cooperation from everybody, you know, he said, Okay, well we'll take this, we'll take this, and we'll combine all this in, into one. As long as you give honor to the to the official Roman gods, then you can keep your traditions and we'll just merge them all in and we'll just we'll we'll just say this is for everybody. Okay? And that's what they did. But and the Catholic Church, they even, they even acknowledge that. And that's, what, that, that's what's really kind of amazing is they acknowledge, you know, the changing to meet the needs of the people. And you see that. I mean, you can even see it with some of the things that the Pope has talked about. You know, how times have changed and, and the church needs to change because society has changed. You know, I mean, it, it's, you know, it, it, it's, I mean it, it's right there. I mean, it's right there and, 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 and we can see it. But the world, I mean, it's something that they just don't see because that they've, you know, they, you know, their eyes, you know, their their eyes are blinded. They just don't see it. So, on the bottom of page four sixteen, here it shows who eats swine's flesh and broth of abominations. And it says, in reading Isaiah sixty five four from the New International Version, uh, interlinear Hebrew Old English Testament. It shows here, uh, you can see here the, the, the photocopy there. It says, uh, the ones eating the flesh of the pig and broth of unclean meats, pots of them. You can see that right there. It's all underlined. And it says, Yahweh's law clearly tells us what meats are clean and what are unclean. Leviticus eleven seven through 8, Yahweh plainly says, the swine in his flesh you shall not eat and his carcass you shall not touch. He is unclean to you. Okay? It doesn't get any clearer than that. It doesn't get any more complicated than that. You know, the swine is unclean. You don't eat it, you don't touch it. In Isaiah 65, 4, we find those who are breaking this law. They are provoking Yahweh to anger by eating these things, sacrificed to idols. Now, here in this same scripture, however, we find that these same worshipers are sacrificing meats, which Yahweh said may be eaten according to his law. But due to the way that these clean meats have been sacrificed, they have become unclean. They have become the broth of abomination. And pastor's really going to hit this, you know, hit this, uh, um, uh, you know, real clearly here. Um, uh, here, here, in a, here in a couple of pages. Uh, but, it, but he talks about what he says. It says, even though this, this, the, the, the meat itself, you know, the meat itself may be clean, but it show, he shows here, he says, but the way, I'm trying to see how he put it here. Um, it, it has become an abomination or has become unlawful through the way that it was used and, the, and to who it was offered up to. Okay, so even if it's clean, you have something that's clean. If it's offered to a God, it then becomes unclean. It's an abomination. Yeah, we will not accept it and we, should have, we, 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 we must not have any part of it. As we read the following information, I ask that you keep this fact in mind, the fact that the sun gods of the mystery religion died violent deaths by being torn into pieces or cut into pieces. Now this word broth here, uh, this word broth is maroc, which is a mixture of meat and vegetables that were combined while heating. And this, and this is what the, the definition here shows, the mixture of meat and vegetables. And then the Hebrew word maroc is word number 4839 in Strong's, and we see it means like kind of a soup. However, the word translated broth in Isaiah 65, 4, it's a different word. This is word, 65, uh, this is word number 65, 64. 
uh, from word number 6561, and it means a soup of crumbed meat. Okay, reading from the definition of the word 6561, we come to the understanding that this crumbed meat was meat that which was torn into pieces. And you can see that here in the definition here, to rend into pieces or to tear into pieces. This broth of meat torn into pieces and vegetables is the ancient equivalent of the lucky mince meat pies that was eaten for the very same mystical purpose. Okay, so you can see what Pastor is showing us here. You know, he's, he's showing us how this was covered here as well. But remember this mystical purpose. What was the purpose of the mince pies? It was for good luck, and um, it was for good luck, and it was also so the participant could be filled with the spirit of the gods, and that's what it was for. Abomination. I like this word, piggle. Pig, piggle? Piggle? Piggle, piggle. It says, the word, the word in Isaiah 65, 4, which has been translated unclean meats in the interla international, interlinear uh, by Kohlenberger by has been translated abomination in the King James Version. And it shows that this means unclean. Uh, it means unclean, an abomina abom abominable, abomin abomination, or abominable thing. The word translated unclean meats, abomination, is pigul, which is a precise technical legal term relating to sacrificially clean meats which are not eaten within lawful limits. You know, the meat itself is clean, but it's not eaten within the lawful limits here. And it says pigul is an even more precise technical term denoting sacrificial flesh not eaten uh, in the allotted time. And we see here Leviticus 7.18 and 19.7. Um, though it seems to have a wider sense in uh, Isaiah 65, 4. It's, the flesh is considered pigul by, by virtue of the intention of the sacrifice. Or you see that? You know, we're seeing the intent. You know, we see intent. And when we deal with the law, you know, when you deal with the law of the land, uh, you know, we, we deal with a lot of things that involve intent. Well, did the, did the, uh, the individual intend for this to take place? If there was no intent, then okay, then it was, you know, then it could be rendered something else. But this is what's, you know, kind of what pastor is, you know, showing us here. It says the flesh would be considered pigul by virtue of the intention of the sacrificer. And what would that intention be? Is this going to be offered to Yahweh? Or is this something that's going to be offered to the gods? If the clean meat is offered or whatever is clean is offered to the gods, or if it's done in honor of the gods, no matter what you do, it's unclean. You know, the table, you know, we're, we're warned. We're warned about how the table can be a snare. And this is why pastor, you know, this is one of the reasons pastor said, you know, be careful around your kinfolk. Be careful around your kinfolk, especially around these pagan holidays. Because everything that they're doing is in honor of these gods. And if they offer you something to eat, well, it's clean. I made it clean. Oh, okay. Well, it's clean. It must be okay. Look at the intent. It was offered to the gods. It was done in honor of the gods. It is an abomination to Yahweh. Okay? It says, it is from this legal term, pigul, that we understand that even clean meats, which Yahweh gave, uh, has, has confirmed in his law as meats which may be eaten, beef, lamb, mutton, goat, clean birds, clean fish, can become unclean by the way that they are used and eaten. It was these clean meats which were torn into pieces for this broth in Isaiah 65, 4, because this meat was prepared for God worship, it was pigul, and those who ate it ate things sacrificed to idols. Therefore, if one sacrifices these same clean foods to any god whatsoever, or these foods are used in any kind of god worship, these same foods become pigul, rotten, stinking, unclean, and completely unacceptable to Yahweh. Isaiah 66, 3, the cult practices of eating things sacrificed to idols. It says, here I must redirect your attention to Isaiah 66, 3, the King James Version, as this scripture, we find exactly what Yahweh himself thinks of anyone who sacrifices to any 
sacrifices any scriptural clean food of any kind to idols, to Satan the devil, the god of this world. In Isaiah 66, 3 here in the King James, it says, He that killeth an ox is as if he slew a man. He that sacrificeth, sacrificeth a lamb as if he cut off a dog's neck. He that offered an oblation as if he offered swine's blood. He that burneth incense as if he blessed an idol. Yea, they have chosen their own ways, and their soul delighteth in their abominations. Okay? And this abomination, abomination or shikuts. The first thing you must understand is the meaning of the word translated abomination. And it shows here, especially idolatrous or an idol, abominable filth, detestable thing. Shekuts refers specifically to unlawful religious objects. And you can see here, it uh, bears a very specific meaning to each of its 28 occurrence and refers to illicit cult objects. What we find in Isaiah 66.3 is that the things which are being offered in this scripture are things, which to, uh, are things which Yahweh has ordained in his law but have become unlawful through their use. Okay, an ox, the word tra uh, translated ox in the scripture should have been translated bull. Bulls were offered as sacrifices in Yahweh's temple. Not oxen, and this word is number 7794 and means a bullock. A lamb, lambs were also slaughtered in sacrifice at Yahweh's temple according to Yahweh's written word. So, I mean, these things are acceptable. You know, we've read about these things. Uh, oblation, the word translated oblation is word number 4503 and gives the defin following definition here to like a donation, a tribute, a sacrificial offering, usually bloodless and voluntary. Gesenius Hebrew and Chaldee lexicon shows these two specific meanings, a tribute which was exacted or a gift offered. It says, from the Wycliffe Bible Encyclopedia, we find that this oblation is actually a grain offering of barley or wheat. You know, the corn, this uh, mincha, was usually presented in Yahweh's temple as fine flour or unleavened bread or wafers. But as we have read, the meaning oblation, mincha, is tribute. These are the tithes and offerings presented at Yahweh's temple. Along the, along, among these ties, the children of Israel presented their gifts of every item of vegetable origin. This word burn incense here, and I, uh, the word burn in Isaiah 66 3 uh, prop, is a, a primitive root properly to mark as to be recognized, that is to remember, to call, to come, to keep, to put in, to, to, to put to remembrance, or to put in remembrance. And it shows that we find the word burn in this, uh, in this scripture actually means to offer a memorial offering. Incense is that of its smoke, you know, the frankincense. It is from the Psalm of David that we find that it is prayer. This prayer, which is the offering to Yahweh as a remembrance of him, which is like incense. Uh, reading Psalm 140, 141 verse 2, we find, May our prayers be set before you like incense. And may the lifting of our hands be like the evening sacrifice. And remember, that's the, you know, the smoke of the incense represents what? You know, it represents the righteous prayers of the saints. Okay? Now, in Isaiah 66, 3, we've read about the sacrifices of bulls and lambs, of grain offerings, and all other offerings of vegetable origin and of prayer. But we have also read of all of these lawful things becoming pagul, that is, rotten, stinking, unclean, and completely unacceptable to Yahweh when any of these things are, are sacrificed or offered to idols or gods. But not only do they become pagul, as we find in Isaiah 66.3, but they also become shekits, which is unlawful cult objects. And Pastor, he clarifies these things here. We, kind of, we touched on them earlier, but we're reiterating this here. If you eat beef during any pagan celebration whatsoever to Yahweh it is as if though you have killed and eaten a man that's how he looks at it if you eat lamb during an idolatrous occasion to Yahweh it's as if though as you have killed and eaten a dog if you prepare and eat any bread cake 
pie, vegetable, beverage at any of the abominable holidays and birthday celebrations of this world to Yahweh, it's as if though it, it is as though you have eaten swine's blood. Okay, you see how easy these things could sneak up on us if we're not careful. So we always we have to keep these things in mind. If you offer any kind of prayer during any of these occasions, to Yahweh you have certainly blessed an idol. But not only is it not but not only this, and and not only this here, now notice this here. Now well, notice what he says, what Pastor reiterates here. But not only this, there is no prayer whatsoever. Nothing that can be done. There's nothing that can be said. There's no offering that can be made. No words that can be uttered to Yahweh, which is going to cleanse any of these abominations, these unlawful objects. There is no scriptural way. When they have been offered, you know, when they have been offered to the gods or in, in, in part of a, of a pagan celebration, you know, asking Yahweh to bless it, it isn't going to work. You can't do it because it's been offered already to the gods. It's already part of that. It doesn't matter. Once it's been tainted, once it's, once it's become unclean, once it's been adulterated, you can't scrub it. You can't go back and clean it. Continuing in our studies of Isaiah 65, 4, we may apply the same principle at this scripture, even though one may, one may eat turkey at Christmas or Easter celebration, or at other pagan celebrations for that matter, rather than eating pork or ham. To Yahweh you have eaten that which is pegul and shakits. It is unlawful and demonic, and, it is, uh, and as is every other item of food and beverage sitting upon that table set for demons. Remember, you can't partake of Yahweh's table and the table of demons. See how deep that goes? I mean, everything there, the, everything that had been offered. Even if it was a glass of water. You know, so we have to be mindful of these things. Man, we've got to be mindful of these things. Because this is how deep the tentacles and how far reaching the tentacles of this abominable worship goes. And it has, it has woven its way so deep. You know, but praise Yahweh, you know, he's sent us a teacher. He's given us a teacher that's pointing these things out to us. So that we can see these things and, and, you know, and be mindful of them. You know, we're gonna ha we have to be mindful of these things. You know, if we if we just look at them and 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 okay, well, yeah, that was yeah, that's that was you know that's pretty interesting. Every, you know, anything that's offered, but we don't, you know, anything offered as a um, in honor of any type of you know any type of pagan celebration. But if we don't keep that in our mind and we don't practice it, you know, we could very easily partake of something that's been offered to gods. It, it could be very easily done. So, uh, you know, the, just that word of caution, you know, we, you know, keep these things in our mind, rehearse these things, keep these things in the forefront of our minds. You know, I'm holier than you. Ask the prophet Isaiah who was inspired to write Isaiah 65, 5. And they... Isaiah 65, 5, the King James Version, those who break the laws of Yahweh think but they are holier than those who keep Yahweh's laws. You know, holiness comes from the keeping of the law of Yahweh. That's where it comes from. But the people that break the laws of Yahweh and teach others to do so, they think in their minds the more laws they break, the holier they are because the more, the, the more that their pagan savior has done for them. They have been able to keep more laws for them. Which stand by you, so we see here in Isaiah 60, 65, 5, which say, Stand by thyself, and do not come near me, for I am holier than thou. And these are a smoke in my nose, and a fire that burneth all the day. You know, this is how Yahweh looks at, those th looks at these things. And it says, in the, from the Anchor Bible, uh, I, Second Isaiah by Mackenzie, on page 195, we find these following comments. The eating of pork is, is, is very probably more than a violation of the dietary laws. It is the use of the pig in a sacrificial cult which was obviously foreign. The idea of ritual holiness 
that could be communicated by contact was not unique with the Israelites, but the use of the word holy, uh, a word of such religious weight in the Old Testament to detestable superstitious rites, is blasphemy, which arouses indignation. You know, the you know you, you think about you know you think about what we're seeing with the marriage and equality now, what has been passed. The, the, the people are being joined together in holy matrimony. You know, that's not holy, not according to Yahweh's laws. It may be according to their definition of holiness, but not according to the only law that really matters, which is the law of Yahweh. You know, the law of Yahweh, that's gonna, that is our protection. You know, that's, you know that, 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 that's our protection, that's our strength. In Isaiah 66, 17, we see this warning. There is a warning here against idolatry. In Isaiah 66, 17, we find this warning from Yahweh that those who practice rituals of, idol uh, of idolatry, the eating of things sacrificed to idols, will be destroyed. You know, verse 17, they that sanctify themselves and purify themselves in the gardens behind one tree in the midst eating swine's flesh and the abomination of the mouse shall be consumed together, saith the Lord. And again, that's out of the King James Version. Those who eat swine's flesh, who eat the abomination and eat the mouse, will be consumed together. This word abomination shows it's an idolatrous object, and it also means filth. You know, yes, they're filthy, they're unclean. These animals are unclean. From the Encyclopedia Judaica, we find this abomination, which is idolatrous, refers to each and every unclean species written in Leviticus 11, 24 through 43. And it says the noun shekez is found only in four passages where it refers to a tabooed, to tabooed animal flesh. We find this information from Wycliffe Bible Encyclopedia, which shows that sacrifices of horses, swine, dogs, and rats were offered in the idolatrous rites associated with the underworld. Remember that cycle of that cycle of sun worship, you know, embodies when 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 they when the winter time and, and the we go from the from the summertime when the things start dying off and you're going down toward the uh, toward the winter solstice, you know, that is when the god the god or the goddess that has been mourned that has been killed and mourned is, is taken into the underworld. And you see that these, rat, the, these, these different sacrifices were associated with the underworld. Now, it shows here, it says, the Levitical laws of purity regulated which animals were considered clean and suitable for offerings to Yahweh. And it's not just suitable for offerings to Yahweh, but suitable for us to eat, the things that are beneficial for us to eat. You know, we're just, you know, we're, you know, we're, we, Yahweh doesn't tell us not to eat the pig and not to have anything to do with the pig um, as far as eating or offering it to, to, to him because he just doesn't want us to have it. You know, he knows, uh, you know, he created it. He knows what, uh, he knows the, the things that it carries, the things that it has, and he knows it is unhealthy. It is, it is not healthy to the human body. Okay. As with all of these unclean animals, and it's not again, it's it's not to deprive us of anything; it's to protect us from everything. So the distinction between clean and unclean animals dates from the earliest times, and we see Genesis chapter seven, verse two, then eight and twenty. Any domesticated beast permissible as a sacrifice to Yahweh was also deemed fit to eat by his covenant people. The criteria whether the animal chews the cud and has a cloven hoof, you know, was was part of that criteria. It has to have both. If it chews the cud but doesn't have a split hoof, if it doesn't have a split hoof but chews the cud, it's still unclean, even though it has, even it's got half of it, or vice versa. If, although it doesn't chew the cud but it has a split hoof, it's still unclean. It has to have both. An underlying reason for excluding other animals, such as the pig, may be found in the danger of contracting such diseases such as trichnosis carried by swine. The principal reason, however, was no doubt the religious taboo against animals which the Canaanites and other pagans offered to their gods. Notice that. There's something else. It's not just that it's unclean, but it was these animals were also used by the Canaanites and other, pagan, uh, you know, other, other pagans to offer to their gods. 
Horses, swines, dogs, and mice or rats were connected with idolatrous rites often associated with the underworld. You know, so they, they, it, was, it was tied in. They were tied in with, the, with this God worship. Now, the International Standard and Bible Encyclopedia shows the second view is far more likely, namely that the Old Testament rejected the eating of swine because of its association, association with the worship of certain, uh, certain uh, Babylonian, Syrian, and Egyptian gods. The involvement, of, the involvement of some Israelites in such pagan rites may well stand behind the prophet's condemnation of eating swine. Well, the prophet said that eating the swine, eating these things, it's an abomination. It makes one abominable. And remember, Pastor has showed us that means that we can get these diseases and these, we can do what with these diseases? Do they stay within us? No. Well, they can be transferred to others. Okay? So we need to keep that in mind also. But Yahweh himself here, it says, for every, it says, every unclean animal and every clean animal, along with every other available item of food, has been sacrificed to the gods of the underworld, the dying and the rising gods, which the pagans worshipped, for uh, for luck, fertility, and wealth, and those were a lot of the things that they that they sacrificed these things for. But Yahweh Himself condemns this worship. So those who follow Yahweh eat nothing which has been sacrificed to these idols, regardless of whether it's clean a clean meat or not, regardless of whether it's clean or not. It doesn't matter if it's been sacrificed to these idols, if it's been sacrificed, offered in service to the gods then it is unclean, okay? And again, remember, he showed that there's no amount of prayer. You can't, we can't just say a prayer over it and, and have it cleansed because once it's been offered to the gods, it has been dedicated to the gods. So Yahweh himself condemns this worship, and worship is simply what? Remember, it's service, okay? So uh, those who follow Yahweh eat nothing which has been sacrificed to these gods or to these idols. Men, we're at an excellent stopping point right here. And this one, this is really going to be interesting when we get into this here about meat and milk. The world has this so messed up. Uh, the, you know, the, the people referred to as the Jews have this really mixed up. You know, they say, well, you can't have, you can't eat milk and meat together. Well, we're going to see next week exactly where they get that from. And we're going to actually see that it's, it's, it, it has actually nothing to do with clean, you know, with, with uh, you know, with combining a clean meat with the, with the, with clean. If you take something that's clean and you combine something else with, with something that's clean, if you, if you take milk that's clean and you have meat and it's clean and you mix them together, does that make it unclean? No, you can't take something that's clean and mix it with something else that's clean and have it become clean. Now you can take something that's clean and then something that's unclean and mix it together and then it's all unclean, right? There's nothing we can do. There's nothing you can know what no amount of cleansing you can do to fix that. Okay, but go back. Remember what Pastor said. Remember what he showed us in here. What would make that clean food? What would make it unclean? The manner in which it's used and the manner in which it's offered up. Okay, and that's actually what that's referring to. And we're going to see that. And we're going to see that next week. That that's what it's referring to. Yeah, you know, when you read that, look and see. Look and see where those verses pop up where it says, "You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk." If it's if it's actually referring to if it's actually referring to uh, if it, if it's actually referring to something that's clean, if it, if it's having to do with clean food, look and see where they pop up. Look and see where those three verses you know where those verses pop up. Those words pop up. It's not in an area. At least two of the areas have absolutely nothing to do with clean or unclean food. But it has to do with idolatrous practices. And here, like I said, we're going to see, get more into that next week. So may Yahweh be with you and bless you, man.